started my academic career in anthropology and then I worked in art and design for a number of years before coming to sociology. Um, and I don't, I don't usually start my talks with an academic biography, but the reason I'm doing that is because that's partly the process through which I've started to engage with thinking about object interviews in particular. So I have a uh, research interest in material culture and materiality. Um, and when I started life as an anthropologist, I did ethnography. And as part of doing that, I sort of ended up doing lots of interviews, um, object interviews. I never would have called them object interviews. I just did them as a kind of part of thinking about it. And gradually as I've come into uh, sociology, I've started reflecting a lot more upon specifically object interviews themselves. Um, and as I'm going to talk a little bit today as one, one particular form of uh, material culture method. But in particular, I wanted to think about them specifically today um, through one particular lens. So there's lots of different ways in which they can be uh, thought about. But in terms of the ways in which an object interview is a way, is an occasion and a way in which people encounter things. So when they use their own possession and understanding and framing the interview as a kind of encounter, but also at the same as a, uh, the same time as a way of connecting. So they are connecting with the things, but in doing so, they are connecting with themselves, their own history, their relationships. So I'll talk through a couple of examples that show that. So I think object interviews are, could be framed and understood more broadly within the remit of creative interviewing. Um, and I think as such, uh, in lots of ways, have become increasingly popular in recent years. And I think understanding them as a kind of part of creative interview is a very constructive way to think about them. But also at the same time, they are, as I would argue and suggest, um, a kind of material method. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about that. So in particular, framing an object interview as a kind of material method. So the, the basic premise or starting point from this is that even if you are not carrying out research into material culture or about material culture, you're not interested in the materiality itself. If you're doing an object interview, you are still doing research with objects. So I think this is an important kind of proviso for people who use object interviews maybe as as I suggested, as part of the kind of broader remit of creative interviewing. And there has been some criticism of, for example, people using objects as a way to just kind of anchor accounts or let's use an object and just see what happens. But framing it as a kind of material method is a way of engaging with the stuff itself. So the kind of objects people use, what impact that has upon the way in which they talk and the kinds of things that we're able to find out. So today I'm going to briefly contextualise object interviews within material methods. And then secondly, to think about what the implications are of thinking about object interviews in this way. So just to give you a little bit of background, I'm not going to um, go too heavy on this. I, I mean, I could talk about this forever, but I appreciate probably not everyone is interested in it as I am. Um, but broadly speaking, I think some of the, we can contextualise this, this within what's been called the material turn. I put it in quotation marks because I hate the phrase material turn, um, partly because, you know, if you look at anthropology they've been looking at objects forever so since the inception of the discipline so I think possibly that reflects uh, what happen what's happened more broadly in other disciplines but since the 1980s there has been what's called the material turn which has led to a profu profusion of interest in things materials materiality within the social sciences and humanities more broadly um, so there are so many different kinds of theories of how we understand things and materiality which is way beyond the scope of me uh, my talk today, so things like actor network theory, objectification, entanglement, new materialism, hundreds of different theories of how we think about things. But I think what this raises is that if we have this ton of interest in objects and materiality, material culture, then we also need to understand, to think more critically about the kind of methods that help us to understand these things. So which is one of the things that I mean by material method. So if we have different kind of theoretical frameworks, different empirical interests, then we also need to attend to what the kind of methodological roots are into this and also the, the kind of possibilities of this for methods. But at the same time, we might see this material turn as happening uh, in parallel and also entangled with the, what's uh, the kind of expansions in visual and also sensory research. Um, and when we take all of these kind of developments together, they highlight the fact that our relations to things are often not verbal, but they're also sensory, material, and emerge through practices. So all of these kind of ways in which we are understanding everyday life to be multisensory, visual, material, and multifaceted, it highlights the importance of thinking about these kind of methods. So there's been a massive expansion in the field of visual methods and sensory methods, but much less so in what's written about material methods. So in terms of how I define material methods. 
So there are two, two kind of frames for thinking about it. The first is that material methods are a route into the substantive field of materiality. So the idea that this is, if you are interested in materiality, material culture, uh, materials, then material methods are the kind of methods that you will use to allow you to understand that. So the idea uh, that there's lots of different kind of theoretical frameworks, but if we're interested in a different substantive field, then this will require different or ad adaptations of current methods. So an object interview is an obvious example of an adaptation of an existing, uh, an existing kind of method of the interview. Uh, but at the same time, there is also obviously a recognition that methods are always part of that field um, itself. So the second way of thinking about material methods is the idea that these are different methods of researching with things. So the idea then this fits into the remit that people might engage with or use material methods if they're not explicitly interested in materiality or material culture. They just want to expand the possibilities of what creative methods can do. So in this way, we can kind of recast and think about material methods as a form, as part of the kind of broader toolkit of creative methods. So one of the ways in which uh, kind of John Law has written about the methods assemblage, so the idea that actually this is one of the ways that we're thinking about this as a kind of form of the production of knowledge and uh, objects are kind of part of that toolkit. So any kind of method we can use to think about the objects that are part of the toolkit of research but also more broadly this discussion around the creativity of methods. So many of you may be familiar with uh, Les Back and Nimal Poor's book, Live Methods, but partly this is engaging with the vitality of methods and the possibilities they have for producing, for capturing social words that are vital. And in many ways, um, I think I want to think about material methods in this remit because things themselves are vital and therefore they have effects upon us. So this very much frames the ways in which I wanted to engage with object interviews as a kind of material method. And uh, partly this is, uh, I wanted to think about object interviews as a, a kind of material method that is also simultaneously provocative. So when I say provocative, I mean the ways in which things can provoke responses in people uh, and also researchers. So partly this is drawing from theories of what things can do. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, kind of go into this in huge amounts of detail, but there's lots of different kind of theoretical positions which suggest the ways in which things can have effect. So sometimes this is called material agency um, or the ways in which things have affordances. So they have particular properties or capacities that impact us. But what all these kind of different theoretical positions taken together say is that objects and things are not just passive. They are not just inert but they bring about effects. So to think about this, you know, through, uh, say, an example from my own research, is I've done a lot of research on objects and memories, and the ways in which people experience and articulate and talk about their memories is very different through how they do it through items of clothing as to how they might do it through food practices, for example. And partly this is because of the affordances of food and the affordances of clothing. So these theories matter in terms of material culture, but also then, if we think about these as methods, this matters in that respect as well, because we are reframing and thinking about um, the objects of an object interview as provoking people to respond in particular ways, and also provoking us as researchers maybe to think differently about a particular topic. So then, specifically an object interview, partly it's a kind of an evident, uh, very evident definition, say it's an, it's an interview that incorporates objects or based around an object. Um, but an object interview then is something which involves uh, the elicitation of individual stories. So depending on the kind of theoretical perspective people take towards it. So for example, you might use an object interview and in, say doing narrative research, and in which case you might use objects to narrate people's lives. Um, so for example, I put a picture of a wardrobe up there because I've done a lot of um, object interviews around people's wardrobes and use them to get stories of people's histories and their aspired to futures. So an object interview can be you know, taken from lots of different theoretical perspectives, but it's often a route into getting individual stories. But it's also uh, a way of getting a kind of dialogue around objects. So in the same way in which, uh, you know, the kind of semi-structured interview more broadly is understood to be a kind of dialogue between researcher and participant, we can also frame that in terms of how we think about an object interview in the sense in which you both respond to the object together. Um, so we can also think about it as a kind of dialogue in that response, in that respect. So sometimes within uh, the literature, you see them being called um, object elicitations. So partly this 
and, and often that's kind of used in an interchangeable way with object interviews. But in many ways, this derives from the method of photo elicitation. So the idea that people use photo, which is a very, very well long established tradition within visual methods of using photographs to elicit people's narratives or experiences or stories. Um, and in the same way, there's an understanding then we can use objects in a similar kind of way. Um, so in terms of how we understand this kind of process of eliciting, uh, this is the idea that we can use things to draw out or to excite responses from people um, and not kind of extract or tap into information. So partly this is, again, fits into some discussions more broadly about um, qualitative interviewing and the ways in which um, that kind of you know, metaphor of the minor, which I think it's Jennifer Mason writes about it, but it's been rejected because the idea that actually you're not kind of using an interview to delve, delve deeper to get some, some kind of truth, but instead it's more about um, getting people to kind of respond in different ways. And it's a similar way. It's not as if somehow using an object in an interview will get you to a kind of true memory or a true response, but instead it's a way to elicit or excite a different kind of response, to get people to talk in a different kind of way. Um, and so whether you do this in terms of an individual object or I've done them in terms of as well um, entire collections of objects, so whole wardrobes, for example, I've done them around. Um, so there's obviously lots of different kinds of ways of doing it. So in terms of broad, I'm going to speak to some specific examples in a minute. But in terms of broadly what this kind of method might help us to understand is firstly the multidimensionality of everyday worlds. So as I mentioned earlier on around the ways in which the sensory, the visual and the material come together, uh, if we accept these kind of turns and what these, these point towards, they suggest that everyday life is multidimensional, it's simultaneously sensory, it's practical, it's verbal, it's material. Um, if we accept this, then material methods are a way to tap into some of this multidimensionality um, and also to think through the entanglement of people and things, so whether that is an explicit interest of yours. Actually, if you're looking at a topic like memory, it allows lots, lots of insight of the ways in which, for example, objects allow people to experience or articulate different kinds of memories. Also allows us to understand material culture, materials and things, which is, um, as I've said, one of my own strong interests. An understanding of multisensoriality. So even though you're doing an object interview, which is about the elicitation of words, the process of doing the interview is also a sensory experience. So, for example, when I've done interviews with clothing, you're doing an interview with it, but you're getting them to try it on as well, and you are getting them to touch it, and so they are engaging materially and sensorially with the object itself. So one of the things about an object interview, then, is it is about the elicitation of words, but it's also about the elicitation of so much more than just words. And then the final theme, which is the one that I'm going to talk about for the uh, rest of today, which is around the ways in which... Um, Object interviews can allow participants to stand back and reflect upon, but also as a kind of point of connection. So partly this connects to the, um, the ways in which object interviews are done. And as I said earlier, I kind of came to object interviews through ethnography. And so they are ethnography as a method that you, you know, is kind of by definition as involving yourself and being part of people's worlds and people's lives. So as a con consequence, doing an object interview, you do it within the kind of everyday experience of people's lives. And it's very different to doing an object interview where you say to people, I'm going to interview you in a cafe or an interview room and I'd like you to bring an object along. And thinking about the kind of differentiation between the two, so having done both methods myself, um, and also I've done quite a lot of um, getting people to write about objects as well, writing workshops with objects too. Um, and I noticed the, the kind of difference that starts to emerge through some of the data through that. So doing a kind of writing workshop around an object or interviewing people with an object that they bring along can sometimes produce a very different process. So it made me start to think about this relationship between allowing people to stand back and also to connect to an object. Uh, so the first kind of aspect of this, as I said, they're kind of connected ideas, is to think about the object interview as a space of encounter. But also I put re-encounter here because it is, if it is people's own objects, and obviously they've already had some kind of encounter with it, so partly this is enabled by an interview out of context. So what I said, let's say, when you do an interview and you get someone to bring an object along, uh, this sometimes enables this kind of space of encounter because they are reflecting upon, looking at, touching, engaging with an object in a completely different context and in a completely different way. So often what is defined, how we could define and understand this idea of um, the encounter is it's a very self-conscious engagement with an object. So uh, 
sometimes objects that people have in their homes they don't see very often, they don't think about it, it becomes part of the kind of background of their everyday lives. And doing an object interview in this way is getting to engage with it in a very, very different kind of way. So partly this can be kind of maybe people bring along a special object, but often I think, so I do a lot of research into everyday material culture, and I think for me I found it to be a really interesting method to allow you to see kind of habitual objects very differently. So things which people use in everyday life and don't think about very much, it allows them to think about it in a completely different way. So as I put here, it allows them to engage with it as an object. Ooh, moving on. Um, so for example, I've done a lot of research on denim and blue jeans, and denim could be in many, blue jeans could in many ways be seen as a kind of archetypal uh, object that we don't even think about. So as part of a broader ethnography that I did about genes, we looked at the ways in which um, it's kind of an example of the blindingly obvious. So things which are very important, lots of people wear them most of the time, but people don't have very much to say about it. So when we first started doing the research, we'd ask people about it. They had almost nothing to say about it. But when I did these kind of uh, old genes interviews, so I got people to talk about genes they're throwing around, throwing out. It was fascinating how much material detail you get because they're engaging with it. So they're looking at the, you know, the ways in which they fray, the shape of them, the kind of paint stains on it, the fraying, how they become bleached, more lined. And as they do this, so they're engaging with this kind of everyday object that they've probably never sat and studied in that kind of detail. But what comes from that is we get some really interesting subsequent discussions around People talk about uh, you know, when they first got them and what it was like to be this particular woman in her early 20s, but for other people, they still had objects that they had when they were a teenager. You get really interesting and evocative accounts of what it was like to be that kind of age. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, that's the same one again. Um, and so the other side of it was thinking about uh, the object interview as a kind of point of connection. So part, sometimes this is, if you're doing an interview in contact, so for example, when I've done interviews... Um, in people's houses about uh, things they keep but they're not using anymore. People will pick it up and just talk about it. And in these instance, there is instances, there is a kind of instant connection with the item and talking about it. There isn't the same self-reflexive engagement. But at the same time, I don't want to separate out to say one comes from interviews in context and the other out of context. Also, I think I'm going to give an example in a second about how people connect through... Um, by reflecting upon it and as a kind of space of encounter. So the idea of encountering and also connecting can be part of the same interview. So to give you an example, so I've done a, my a current research project, which I'm still in the process of analysing writing up, is about dormant things. So that's things people keep in the home but they're not using anymore. So attics, cupboards, uh, lots of boxes like this with a load of um, massive bag of old mixtapes in there, you can see. Um, old cables, lots of things like that. Um, and so this was an example of a box that someone had brought from their parents' house when their parents had told them, enough, I want my house back again. So this is one of the examples of kind of uh, boxes. And this woman was kind of in her late 40s anyway, so she'd kept this stuff for a long time. And it was really interesting because it was an occasion for her to re-encounter it. So there's an interview in her house. Um, and I could see that they clearly affect, affect her in the interview. So she knew I was coming around, she knew she was going to get it out, but it's not a box she goes in very often. And it's really interesting the ways in which this is a, a re-encounter, but it's also a clear point for her to connect with her past, with her former relationship with her sister, with her parents. So, for example, when she looks at the mixtape, she starts telling me about, oh, I remember who made that for me, and I remember when I was at university and I did this. And she has these two riding hats in there, uh, which she still keeps because apparently you're not allowed those hats anymore, so no one can reuse them. And she says she gives me this really vivid story of exactly remembering when she bought it and I remember the shop and I remember what it looked like and actually it allows her then to kind of connect to her past in a way that most probably had I asked her to sort of talk about her childhood in a simply verbal way without those objects we wouldn't have got all of those kind of narratives so um, you can see here it's a kind of clear example of a connection but the same person so an opposite example uh, that I just wanted to show is it's not all about connection. Obviously, there are also lots of disconnections. So this particular interview around this bag, it's the same person's bag, ends up with her throwing the bag out at the end of the interview. Um, so it's a bag that she's had stashed under her bed, and she got it for a first ever job, um, and she said she's kept it because it's still got life in it. I might need it one day. It's a very basic style, she says as well. But then when we open it, she realises that she's still got the notebook in it from that first ever job and she realises she's not touched it for sort of 25 years. And so this kind of narrative around, maybe I'll use it one day, starts to fall apart. 
And she also then talks about the story, oh, it reminds me of the suit I bought, I only wore it, I realised no one wore a suit, horrible, cheap suit from H&M. So you get these really kind of vivid memories that come from it, but at the same time she feels kind of disconnected from the item because she doesn't particularly like it, she has no kind of affection or emotion around that particular job. And so this becomes a point where she gets rid of the object. And so this kind of space of re-encountering isn't just about connection, sometimes it is about a kind of disconnection as well, as people want to get rid of these things or they don't feel a particular connection to a moment in their past. So I think it opens up all sorts of interesting uh, kind of ambiguities and complexities as well. Um, so kind of drawing that uh, together is that the object interview is often then a space of encounter. So uh, there's all sorts of, there's a massive theoretical literature on the difference between an object and a thing and materials. Um, but I'm particularly struck in this in relationship to Tim Ingold's discussion of an object, which he rejects the word altogether. But he says it's when something comes to appear in opposition to you, it's kind of against you. Um, and actually, I was thinking in some ways, the object interview is kind of like that because you're encountering it as another, you're thinking about it as something different, and then gradually you might come to be connected to it or not. But partly we see the ways in which people are reflecting on it materially. They're reflecting on the object's materials, aesthetics, functions, and also maybe the connections to people and their lives. So this might lead to kind of people feeling more connected, or it might lead to disconnections might lead to uncertainties or ambiguities. So there's lots of different kind of possibilities. And this is just one of the themes around object interviews. I probably could have given about 20 different talks about the topic, but just decided to focus on this one. Um, and by way of a conclusion, I'm going to promote my own book. So <laughs> if you are interested in material methods, it came out this week. So there is a chapter on object interviews as well. So in case any of you are interested, then feel free to read it.